Good day. Let's go over chapter two in digital forensics, cyber forensics, if you will. Uh, just a couple of notes to get you started. Um, some of the discussion requirements, uh, seven days per week is mapped out as if we're in a class session. Usually you have week one, week two, week three, and that's just part of the uh, accreditation um, way that they, they are managing um, class requirements per se. Now we have three days of participation during the seven days and that gives us actually if you look at the what they call the Carnegie units what the accreditation required they that gives us um, roughly in a an equivalent of 56 contact hours per um, uh, the full semester if you will and that's how they measure at a minimum 56 hours and up for the uh, accreditation. Now that's that's part of the requirements, rules of the game, and also uh, the three days of participation are really to keep your head in the game in terms of really understanding the materials and keep doing a wraparound. So I know a lot of you use Facebook and LinkedIn. I note that here. Think of it like popping out to LinkedIn or even Facebook and doing a post. Um, ho hopefully a little more in-depth using research. Uh, so uh, my, cons my concern is that or suggestion is that you post your initial response early so if i was taking a similar course i would uh, let's say monday through sunday wrap around seven days I'd, I'd consider posting my initial response maybe monday tuesday or wednesday and that gives other people some time to look at your response when they after they post their response following wednesday or thursday whenever you would post your initial response and you can plan it for any time you want um, Follow up two additional times. Now that gives you, if you post it by Wednesday, that gives you Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to do two additional posts, one per day. You know, pick two days. And this is a schedule that you can fit in with your own time requirements. Uh, so that gives you a total of three posts per week. One that's a little more comprehensive, your response uh, to the initial discussion post. And then just two follow-up posts. You're adding to the conversation, if you will. Almost, almost like uh, if we were talking about something in class. So if we were in a class that met, let's say, three times per week, or even one long night, uh, I've taught many three and a half, four hour classes once a week, uh, that we would uh, contribute to that conversation to really kind of get our uh, the juices flowing about uh, the, the topic of the week, if you will. So three, three total responses, uh, research, do some additional research beyond the book, because quite frankly, there's some uh, I, I'll note uh, something in just a few minutes about a glitch I found in the book. Um, uh, you know, we're, we have an academic writing it versus a practitioner. I consider myself a more of a practitioner than, you, um, than um, the author of this text. So, um, cite and reference uh, any sources in APA giving credit to that author. A citation is where you would have, uh, for example, if you paraphrase something, you paraphrase that sentence and then you cite the author right after that. That citation pairs up with a full and complete reference at the bottom of your posting, if you will. Uh, paraphrase instead of using quotes. And, you know, I've read the text, I've read many articles, and I, I don't want to read them again. And also, that's more for me. For you, digesting it and putting it in your own words really drives it home. You know, we that's the way we all learn. And I really am encouraging a deep dive into learning in this course. And that's one of the things about discussion questions and us having a very rich discussion set of questions is that we can learn from each other. And uh, that's the way uh, it is best presented and uh, based on my background and my experience in not only the field but also academia as well. So uh, give me a, a shout out if you get a little lost on that. Um, and uh, I tell you what, I'll post a couple of examples of responses to discussion so you can kind of see it. It's in, Everything's really in your own words. You use research to kind of support what you're saying and then use APA to cite that research, because you want to give somebody else credit for their work, okay? Um, accreditation requirements, next one down. The Cengage Mind Taps, it looks like everyone's pretty much registered. Uh, not everyone's participated yet, so if you're getting a little bit snagged on that, let me know. I, I can uh, either help you out, with certainly with the content. Uh, we can dial in on Cengage, we'll figure it out. We've got to get you going on this, okay? So um, the next, getting into chapter two, um, let's talk about it as a quick overview. A couple of items. We're going to describe the certification requirements. 
Now, and also for the lab, not only individually as a person, but your lab also needs to be certified. Uh, and Chapter 2 does a pretty good job in, in fleshing that out. Uh, there's also a list of physical requirements for a uh, digital forensics lab. And I want to have a caveat on that, let me say. As, as a um, lab, somebody who uses labs, uh, your lab will shape depending on what your focus is. Uh, certainly if you're doing more of the cell phone investigation or mobile device investigation, or even if you're doing, uh, let's say, blockchain investigation, uh, your hardware may change a lot more than, let's say, if you're doing the traditional um, uh, computer networking type of computer slash networking type of uh, digital forensics. And by the way, as you can kind of infer, if you're doing your own side gig, uh, you, you will pick a path because I don't think anybody can afford doing everything, be a one-stop shop. If a one-stop shop would require uh, 10 people at least, in my opinion, from seeing everything that's been happening in this field, just because of the explosive growth in technology. So um, keep that in mind when you're looking through uh, the digital forensics lab requirements. It, uh, the author goes through a pretty decent um, background scenario, so I give you kind of a good idea. But just let, to let you know, that would expand even more so, given the craziness of our uh, ever-growing environment. Uh, the, there's a, a section in there about the basic forensic workstation. You can buy uh, a dialed-in forensic workstation, whether it's a laptop or a, um, you know, a, a desktop, if you will, um, or a tower. Uh, however, um, my recommendation would be those things are very expensive. You can, if you know how to build a computer, you can get all the specs and put all the hardware pieces and parts together and probably save 30 or 40 percent at least. So, um, but anyway, you can see that basic forensic workstation sta that's listed in uh, the chapter. And though, again, uh, based on your focus, you may have to add certain other items as well. And uh, a business case, anything that we start with, um, it's always good to think of the business case, a use case, if you will, use cases of how you're going to use that tool, that technology, so that you're appropriately dialing that in for the environment, that you're not overspending. You can easily overspend in technology, as we all know. Right? We can either spend way too much for that server <laughs> when we can perhaps get a virtual instance, for example, or use Docker or something of that nature. So a lot of that is discussed just on a fundamental basis in, in, uh, that ch in Chapter 2. Um, forensics lab certification, there's that uh, the, kind of the gold standard is that second chunk, the ANSI ASQ National Accreditation Board standard. Look through that. Um, Digital Forensics Lab is where you conduct your investigation, where you store your evidence and that sort of thing. And of course, storing evidence, you'll need the check-in, check-out procedures, locked, perhaps even fire-safe cabinets, depending on what type of work you're doing. Uh, it's always a good idea. If you're in a home environment, you're going to have to beef it up. I uh, do some items at home like we all do, and I'm required to have locked doors, uh, a safe where I store items in and that whole nine yards. So my home office is pretty secure, if you will. So if you're thinking about doing a side gig or if your employer lets you work at home, which mine does, which is kind of cool, uh, you'll have to adhere to those standards. Again, you're going to be hammered in court about your policies, your procedures, your processes, and your practices of how you run your shop, whether it's a sole shop or if you're working in a whole group of individuals. Uh, that comes into big play, if you will. Uh, the budget, again, this is dialing back to we can overspend. So dialing it in with use cases, what we're really going to use, kind of match that as a cross grid between what you can afford and what the use cases are, if you will. That gives you a good uh, uh, approach to handling your lab environment. So expenses can include that on this list, hardware, software, the space, the utilities on non-training personnel. And by the way, if you're doing a side gig, always think in terms of taxes, what's a write-off, what can be written off, if you will, uh, what you can leverage in that term. That's really not talked about too much in, in this chapter, but keep that in mind, especially if you're going to do either side work, your own solo practice, or even if you're working, let's say uh, in, I'm working for a, um, on DISA right now, and so through what, whatever I do at home, I'm taking off a lot of tax deductions because of that. So that's part of the whole gig because it's an expensive business. It really is. 
Um, certification and training. This is one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, update your skills through training. Of course, there's a typical three-year cycle for ongoing certification. And um, part of the reading is dialing in on the different certs. I put out an article about a year and a half ago, and I, I'm sharing the link here. And uh, it's because ISC squared kind of changed. They initially dropped the cert. Uh, it looks like they may have revamped it, but it left me a, a bit in alert. So I wrote an article about that. It gives you a lot of different resources in that article for certifications. And, and uh, my impressions about that. The, the author in, in the uh, text indicates that it's an active cert. Mm, not so. So that's kind of the difference between uh, academia, if you will, and practice. Uh, so read that article. Uh, let me know what you think. Comments are certainly appreciated. Anyway, uh, physical requirements of the lab. How big? How, how big is big? How small is small? Um, uh, certainly, I, I would, uh, I'm would. i in maybe about 400 square feet right here, and that's sufficient. I probably could use more space um, at the office. Uh, I'm in a shared lab environment, we probably have, gosh, maybe 3,000 square feet. So that's part of the gig, if you will, especially if you're going to do either a solo gig or do some work at home for your employer. Everything needs an inventory control tag. I have asset controls on all my computers here. Uh, it, the asset control tags go into a database that uh, also will tell me when something is ready to upgrade and, and that whole nine yards. So you want asset, asset A-S-S-E-T, control tags on all of your equipment, uh, even if you're doing it as a solo gig, because again, tying back to taxes, if you have an asset tag, you know when to kind of cycle out a piece of equipment. And by the way, there are some pieces of equipment that I have that are quite old because from time to time you'll run into somebody that has a zip drive or a three and a half inch floppy or even five and a quarter inch floppy. So you'll have a, a stack of older hardware and even some software. At, at the office I have uh, some uh, MS-DOS 6.1 6 uh, disks. I think there's, it's a whole deployments on 12 disks. It's kind of strange, but sometimes you keep all of that old stuff because some, sometimes the bad guys will even use the old technology on purpose because everyone's so accustomed to moving forward with newer, newer, newer. Sometimes the older stuff, it's harder to dial, <laughs> dial in if nobody has the equipment nor the software to match. So we got to keep that in, in inventory as well. Um, High-risk investigation. Look at the uh, electromagnetic EMR. Uh, items as well. Sometimes I wonder if I need that, like uh, 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 clothing, <laughs> to protect myself, if you will, from all the radiation that I have. So look at some of the, the Tempest facilities where you may have some shielding to pr protect from somebody interfering or uh, even stealing data from you as an investigator. Uh, evidence containers. This is ad nauseum talked about. Uh, bottom line, everything gets locked up. And you never use the original evidence. And that makes sense. It's not like you're going to pick up a, a pistol at a crime scene and use it because you want to go out uh, practicing. <laughs> practicing. You'll lock any evidence that you acquire, any digital evidence. And we're not going to, in a crime scene, we're only going to take what we are authorized to by the lead investigator. There will always, if you're working for a cop shop, there will always be a lead investigator. If not, you request one because uh, if you messy up... <laughs> a crime scene, it is on you. So you always want that lead investigator's signature um, on any evidence that you collect. And of course, uh, you would will provide, not only will he or she provide you with a signature authorizing you to take evidence, you will also provide them with a receipt that you took the evidence. And then when you get back, and, 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 and by the way, you, you will travel with that evidence in a lockbox uh, with a either padlock or um, 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 Oh, heck. Well, you have it locked in. Now, uh, I've seen some investigators uh, will actually uh, have it, a lockbox mounted in their trunk. That's how serious some of this stuff gets. So uh, you transport that back, and then you even log it in when you log it into your own individual safe or locked cabinet. You have to keep that chain of custody going, and I'm, I'm emphasizing that strongly because that's part of the game. Um, overseeing the facility maintenance, static electricity, pads. Uh, if you've ever taken a, a computer course that, where you build um, uh, machines, you'll talk about static pads, having wristbands. We have all of that stuff in, the, in our lab. Uh, certainly you want to take that kind of 
precaution, uh, dirt, any kind of dust, generally has some sort of static in it. So uh, keep, keeping the environment just pretty spotless, if you will. Um, and uh, uh, things like sensitive materials, anything, I've got binders that have, uh, you know, a couple of top secret binders here because I'm working for DISA right now. And those get locked up when I'm not using them. Everything gets cleaned up always. I'm always constantly cleaning. I feel like I'm a bit of, I, I'm, I'm kind of like uh, the odd couple, more like the one that's always messy, but I'm always cleaning up at the same time. So <laughs> anyway, that's part of the, the game, if, if you will. But it's also good practice. That's best practice. Physical security, um, um, if you will. Now at the office, we have sign in badges, everything else, but at my home office, I just make sure I lock the door um, even so that if I'm not here, if somebody actually gets in the front door, they have to actually also break into my office door as well. So that needs to be locked. If I'm having guests over, I don't have any wandering eyes or somebody saying, oh, I just need to get on your internet, which box do I use and start you know playing around? Because I, I've seen that happen at other investigators sites. So you don't that, that, that's not cool. It, it will break the confidentiality, the trust you will have um, with whoever you're working with. So keep that buttoned up quite a bit. Uh, there's things like hire a security guard and install an alarm system. I do have an alarm system, but those, those have to be dialed back to your environment, but always a very robust, secure posture. Um, forensic workstation, chatted a bit about that. There's a little more in the book about that. It says it depends on budget and needs. I would always go for the needs first. As a digital forensics expert working in the cybersecurity field, I dial in what I need for a workstation, and basically, bottom line, you charge for what you provide. You don't overcharge. You don't undercharge. And I had mentioned if you're doing on your own shop, you probably will be charging around a $250 an hour fee, if you will, or more, depending on your expertise. Uh, let's see. A disaster recovery. Always plan for stuff to happen, especially if you're in a home environment, floods, fires, uh, break-ins, thefts, you know, that whole nine yards. Somebody um, um, borrows your computer, somebody steals your computer, somebody, and by the way, you won't only, in this business, you're not going to just have one computer. You'll probably have, right now I have, I have seven, and then I ha also have a lot of virtual instances. Um, I have uh, a couple other items there that I, I go with, and um, I also dial into some secure uh, cloud services that are NIST uh, secure, if you will. And there's a whole gamut of what that means in terms of security because clouds is another wonky area. And I'll post some, um, during our course, well, I'll post some additional videos about cloud, if you will, because really that kind of will also help offset expenses. But you need to make sure that you're getting secure cloud services, which are a lot more. It's not just going out and uh, grabbing a, a Google Docs folder that that would be highly risky. So we'll talk about that more in depth in the later on in the course. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about building out your lab. Or if you're building out a lab for your home environment or you're attached to your company. Upgrades, uh, by the way, the risk management with upgrades, uh, you can blow things out of the water. So you always have to make sure even you cannot rely on either Microsoft or Oracle, etc. All the really good companies to do a superb job on their upgrades whether it's Apple, uh, Windows, uh, Linux, you always have to have some sort of backup contingency plan uh, in, in case, and that's part of the risk management. Um, when you do update uh, and upgrade, let's say if you're using FTK as your forensics environment, you don't want to upgrade in the middle of doing an analysis. Uh, let's say if you're investigating a hard drive and FTK comes up with the, oh, brand new version of FTK, do not upgrade right away. You can really seriously screw yourself up in terms of, uh, uh, of the investigation. It sort of breaks that chain. So you'll want to plan that upgrade uh, perhaps right after uh, and also have a plan to, back, to go backwards. I keep multiple versions of FTK and other software that I use for investigations uh, in order to back up so I can say, I'm use, I'm, uh, let's say in a year from now, I've done a case and it was an FTK XYZ, uh, um, and they came up with a brand new version uh, FTK ZZZ. I need to know that what version that investigation was done on those particular devices, so I can always dial back if need be to that particular version if there was a problem. Okay, and also uh, in terms of using image files, one thing you definitely want to do, and I know I'm going a little bit off topic, and 
I will, <laughs> um, is that you always want to make sure not only that you know what uh, upgrades you have, is that uh, what uh, how you've uh, um, frozen that um, disk bit copy. Uh, there's a lot of different software, so you always want to make sure that you, on your chain of custody and also on your uh, process document that you detail what versions of software, what you use, when you did it. That way you have you can always kind of recapture that. But always have a backup plan uh, for your environment overall. But there is a risk of upgrading software. Keep that in mind as you move forward. Uh, it says computing components last 18 to 36 months under normal conditions. And quite frankly, I burned out a lot of computers. I, I've worn them out. And I, there's some hardware that I, I can tell you that I really like and some that I don't. But that's all my preference. You can always email later and, and see why I use certain things and why I avoid certain companies. You'll get to that point, too. Um, I look at them like I look at hardware kind of like an appliance, like a refrigerator. There's some refrigerators that I would love to buy, a couple of different brands. And some I don't. Not that I have multiple refrigerators, but that kind of gives you the idea. Uh, in summary, this is kind of an interesting lab because, not a lab, but I'm sorry, an interesting chapter because really uh, you're talking about the environment. We're going to start dialing into some lab exercises again next week. This week, not so much, but it's more of the overview, the context. Uh, so look over that uh, forensics lab. It's where you conduct the investigation, store evidence. So you have to do that in a very methodological uh, manner, if you will. And you always want to seek your up, uh, skills um, uh, um, through training. I mentioned a couple of training arms in that uh, article, so read that through. Actually, feel free to always pop me a question about this. I'm very passionate about cybersecurity, digital forensics, and I've done it for years. I, I know the ropes, so just drop me a note, even after the course. So uh, physically secure, the lab environments, uh, of course, you never want to make sure. I've never lost any evidence, thank you. God. So, and uh, uh, it's uh, the last point is harder to plan a computer forensic lab for a police department than for a private organization. Private organization, they're generally looking for things that, you know, people are stealing things. So, also, the, the criteria is a little bit different in terms of uh, uh, if you find somebody's been stealing out of the cash register, been stealing hamburger buns, been stealing whatever you're selling, uh, the, the, the level of evidence. Uh, uh, is a, a lot lower that bar of evidence and also the uh, the management of that evidence it's not so rigorous as if you're going to a murder case for example as we can all see so um, this last slide a forensic workstation needs to have adequate memory and so on I talk about use cases identify what use cases are you going to use it just for organizational items are you going to use it for cop shop are you going to be uh, working with a given uh, organization that's going to be piecing you out, if you will, get paying you hourly, or you're going to be full time at a company. That company will tell you what specs, but uh, you will also decide what parameters are good for your working environment. It's a very creative, intellectual environment, by the way. Again, prepare business cases to enlist support of your managers if you're going out or if you're doing your own individual uh, shop. Those uh, business use cases. Um, um, are something that will guide you. And by the way, I do want to mention two things. Business use cases, how you as the user of uh, hardware, software will approach that in the context of how your clients will be interfacing with you. That's one thing. Another thing is the that the book kind of is lighter on is the environment. The business environment mandates a lot of the context as well besides the use cases. Now, for example, I'm saying, uh, a, as an example, would be an environmental concern. I have to adhere to NIST standards uh, for cybersecurity uh, because of the federal government. That is a whole umbrella of regulations of compliance that uh, gear uh, the business environment that I work in. The use cases are how I interface individual on man, many use cases on how I interface with users and what they require. So there's that overarching um, umbrella, if you will, a, a business environment plus the multiple use cases. So keep all of that in mind. I hope this is a good overview uh, for chapter two and uh, I will chat with you later.